I'm Nicole Leonard, health reporter for Connecticut Public. The coronavirus has changed life as we know it here in Connecticut. Schools, restaurants, social events, and as of today, hair salons, they're all shut down. Meanwhile, many, many people are wondering how long this social distancing will last and what will be the impact to our economy. Hospitals are bracing themselves as more patients become sick. 15 mobile testing centers have opened up around the state. But it's very confusing. Who can get tested? Who is most at risk? To help us answer questions about coronavirus in Connecticut, we've invited health experts in studio. We've also gathered questions from our viewers and listeners that I'll be asking throughout the hour. With us in studio is Dr. Henry Anyamadu. He's infectious disease doctor at the Hospital of Central Connecticut. Dr. Kevin Dekaus, Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at UConn, and Dr. Joseph Vinets, Professor of Infectious Diseases at Yale School of Medicine. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. So I'm gonna jump right into it. What does the coronavirus look like here in Connecticut right now? So just looking at the numbers, we've had 159 confirmed cases as of tonight, uh, up from 68 on Tuesday, and there have been three deaths. Now, Dr. Dekaus, these numbers are changing daily, if not hourly. And so when we look at these numbers, they can be scary to people. How should we be interpreting these numbers? Is it bad that we're seeing the numbers go rise so rapidly? What can we tell people about how they should really be looking at them? Well, that's a very important question. Um, as you know, uh, understanding the number of patients, uh, the uh, uh, progression of the epidemic is important for planning purposes as hospitals prepare for the epidemic and prepare for patients as they enter the hospital. So the numbers that we're seeing are increasing um, and that's been predicted. Uh, the question is how far that's going to go, how high it's going to go, and those numbers help us uh, determine the mitigation strategies that are going to be needed to help kind of dampen that, uh, that impact on the healthcare system. And before this outbreak, uh, many people had never heard of the term coronavirus before, but they may not have actually realized that they know some other of coronaviruses. Uh, Dr. Anyamadu, can you explain how this novel strain of coronavirus is actually part of a family of similar viruses? That's right, you're right, Nicole. So uh, most of the coronaviruses we know causes common colds, right? And in general, they are about four different genera of coronaviruses, right? And they are classified as alpha, beta, uh, gamma, and delta. So the novel coronavirus that we are dealing with right now is a beta coronavirus, right? And it's similar to SARS, and it's similar to MERS as well. So MERS and SARS are both coronaviruses, right? But, and then the novel coronavirus, which is the uh, SARS-CoV-2, it's very related to SARS-CoV-1, and that's why they are both in that class of beta coronaviruses. So when we talk about some of the, the related uh, viruses, we did have a question. One of our first uh, listener questions is Mark from Basra, and he did ask, uh, why is everyone in such a panic? This is not Ebola, this is not AIDS. It's roughly the same mortality rate as the flu, and it doesn't affect children. So Dr. Vinets, could you address why this is so serious, uh, while it may not be as serious as SARS, MERS, and Ebola, and what, what are the true mortality rates that we're looking at right now? So it's actually far more serious because this particular virus, SARS coronavirus 2, um, is far more infectious than these other coronaviruses. Ebola virus has a very high mortality rate, but isn't very contagious, isn't very infectious. And so this virus is at least tenfold, somewhere between 10 and 34, 30 fold more lethal than the influenza, than seasonal regular influenza virus. That has been really kind of glossed over by some policymakers because the there's so many people that are subclinically infected even though the virus um, may not show up in symptoms people are infectious for a period of time before they get symptoms virtually everybody with this virus will actually become symptomatic but in the couple of days before people can be 
transmitting this virus, especially children. So children are not immune to this virus. They just don't have a severe disease on an age by age group basis. And so uh, when I see photographs of young people congregating in bars or on the beach because they think that they can't get it, that message needs to go out that that's simply not true. And in fact, over the last few days, we have seen evidence that, that young people, not, not small children, um, but young people, say teens to 20s, are actually getting, because there's so many of them, the millennial generation is a large generation, there's a lot more of this generation going to the hospital. This is very serious indeed, and it's these young, otherwise pretty healthy people that usually have a good outcome that are actually a big source of spreading it through the community. 10 to 30 fold more lethal than seasonal flu. This is cataclysmic. And when we're talking about how infectious this is and, how, and perhaps maybe how contagious, uh, I wanna back up a little bit and um, ask Dr. Anyamaru, how is this passed from person to person? How, how do we see this virus, in its, how it's so contagious, get from per, person to person? So in general, this virus can transmit from one person to the other, right? And it's, you, the data that we have right now shows that it's mainly droplet, right? So you can generate droplets by either coughing or sneezing. And it's amazing that if you sneeze, you actually generate about 100,000 droplets. And it takes only a few droplets with these virus to infect someone. So that's why it's very important that we, uh, we make sure that we are washing our hands, we make sure that we are cleaning surfaces that are frequently used, we make sure that we are uh, uh, distancing ourselves from people who are sick. And by cleaning surfaces, one of the things that we often forget is our mobile phones, right? Which I usually say that it's your third hand because you carry it everywhere with you. So that's why it's really important because this, can, this virus can transmit from one person to the other very quickly. And Dr. Dekaus, when we talk about how it can transmit from, from person to person, if you can't prevent from coming in contact the virus and you do become infected, for those who are becoming infected, are we seeing everyone experience the same symptoms to the same degree or is this varying? Right, it's quite variable. So actually about 80% of people that have this virus exhibit very few symptoms, if any. Um, it's only 20% that will develop symptoms that would bring them to a healthcare provider. And it's the smaller percentage that we're seeing with the testing these days, the 5% or the unfortunate, you know, 2 to 3% mortality rate uh, that are getting tested that we're really focusing on in the news. So the, the distribution is quite variable. Um, the uh, main symptoms are fever. That's the classic symptom is fever. Uh, about two-thirds will have a cough. Uh, about two-thirds will have fatigue. Um, myalgias will be seen in about a third, myalgias is muscle aches, um, as well as shortness of breath in about a third. And when we see these symptoms develop in people, uh, it, does it, would it, could it look different for somebody who maybe has an underlying medical condition or has more complex medical needs? Absolutely, and that's the difficulty that uh, we're running across because we are in flu season. Um, and so differentiating seasonal flu or the variety of other viruses that are out there can be very difficult. Uh, fever seems to be a, a big differentiator. Um, and so if someone has fever plus one of these other symptoms, it's probably wise to get in, in touch with your healthcare provider. Now we have another question from one of our listeners um, and I'll throw it out to any of you who uh, would can answer this. Uh, it's Roger from Stanford and he asks, what evidence exists, if any at this point, that if you get it once, you will become immune to a subsequent infection and, and pretty much get sick from this again. Uh, is there any evidence that people can develop so immunity yet? So at this point, we really don't understand that very well. There's no robust evidence to say that you can get it again or you may not get it again, right? We all know that there's, uh, there was a day, uh, one report from Japan that said that there was a woman who uh, had got infected with coronavirus <coughs> and uh, recovered from it and then got infected again because it got tested again and was positive. But the truth is we really don't understand whether 
uh, you can get it again. In general, when you get a viral illness, you're expected, if you have a robust immunity, you're expected to produce antibodies against the virus so that you don't get the virus again. But as to how long that, uh, that antibodies last remains to be determined. Dr. Dekaus. So I think this is a really important question uh, because it, it, it uh, uh, predicts how vaccines may work. Um, so if you have a natural infection and that, that prevents you from ever having that infection again, that can, uh, is favorable for vaccine production. Uh, we can borrow from some data from MERS, Middle, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, where uh, patients who have had MERS do seem to be uh, relatively immune, at least in the near future, uh, from catching MERS again. And so that's a related coronavirus. Again, this is a virus that's only been you know, known to us uh, for only a few months. So uh, we'll have to see how this plays out. This is a very important question, again, for vaccines. But there's a big difference between getting an infection with a virus and then getting a vaccination with some component of the virus. And a big topic right now in the clinical trials that are just starting early phase one trials has to do with how much of the protein do you put in the vaccine, which has to do with the spike protein, the one that lets the virus stick to cells. Do you use the whole protein, part of the protein? How do you design a vaccine? Because viruses are pretty clever and they have, uh, it's entirely possible that some people uh, who get this novel coronavirus, the virus itself may kind of prevent a good re immune response in some people. This is all where we have to find out through actual clinical studies to find this out because this is the basis really of uh, vaccine development. And I want to go back to actually uh, related to this topic that you mentioned children before. Mm. And uh, as I understand it, scientists are looking at how children are experiencing this coronavirus because uh, in general, they seem to be having uh, an overall more mild reaction to the coronavirus. Some of them don't develop uh, symptoms. So what else can you tell us about why children may be um, overall experiencing some more milder cases than uh, adults seem to be? So I think some of that speculation, well, it's all speculation. Um, it's possible that, so there's a number, there's a, a four or five coronaviruses that cause the common cold. It's, is it possible, that's a question that has to be answered, that having previously experienced an infection from one of the others predisposes to either worse or better from the novel uh, illness from the new coronavirus? We don't know the answers. And until we start deploying antibody tests, which we still don't have, which we're developing at Yale and many others as well, until we can even look at the quantity of antibodies, the function of antibodies, simple things uh, in the laboratory that we have to connect to our patients, we don't know the answers, but that's how we will find the answers. And we did ask somebody that, uh, we did get asked by someone uh, if children can be asymptomatic carriers of this virus. Is that something that's known or that's something that needs more research? So I think we know that uh, even in children, they'll develop some sort of um, low-grade infection. I don't think it's going to, uh, uh, it's been, numbers have been cited upwards of 95% or even more of everybody that gets infected will have some sort of symptoms. It's just, do people develop the cough that advances to pneumonia to the intensive care unit? That is definitely an age and, and comorbid illness dependent thing. Children don't have those, but they are infected. And the, the key message is children are infected. They are not immune from infection. So when we look at how contagious this, this new strain of coronavirus is and how many people are certainly getting infected from it, uh, we know that recently the World Health Organization did declare COVID-19 as a pandemic. Um, and Dr. Animailu, um, does this happen often? And, and why are they considering this to be a pandemic? So the, uh, the World Health Organization determines whether a disease is a pandemic or whether a new viral illness is a pandemic based on certain criteria. One of the things that they need is that it's a novel uh, disease that can spread from one person to the other very quickly and that can 
infect a, a very high number of people and then can cross borders and infect other countries at the same time. And at this point, we know that uh, uh, the COVID-19 is infecting uh, uh, almost about 150 countries. And all over the US, now we know that in 50 states, coronavirus is everywhere, right? So it's truly a pandemic by every definition. Dr. Vanessa. I would just want to note that the word pandemic has been used um, in the press, in the media, and people are terrified of that word. And just because something's a pandemic doesn't mean that everybody's going to die like it's the plague. So pandemic doesn't mean necessarily lethal. It means that the disease is spreading person to person rapidly. So this happened in 2008 to 2009 with the H1N1 influenza virus. Hundreds of millions of people were infected within two months. That's remarkable. That's far more than has gone on now, right? That was a pandemic. There was mortality. It was a novel virus, kind of related to the Spanish flu, but not nearly as virulent as the 1918 Spanish flu. But these are pandemics. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's more lethal or less lethal. Ebola virus was not a pandemic, but it has a, an incredibly high case fatality rate. Mm -hmm. So the number of people who get it die. But it, we were afraid it would turn pandemic, but it didn't. Because it does, it's hard to go from person to person. Novel cor coronavirus, pretty easily one person could infect somewhere between two and four other people. And it goes fast. And I would just add that a pandemic, uh, the terminology is, uh, is a political term. Um, so declaring a pandemic uh, raises awareness. Um, and so when WHO declares this as a pandemic, uh, it really notifies countries that this is serious. They need to readjust how they're viewing this illness and reallocate resources to uh, preventive medicine to public health. Right, and before this declaration was made, this virus um, first uh, emerged in China and it spread to a lot of the surrounding countries first uh, and the rest of the world was watching that happen. Um, and in the United States early on, the cases that were being diagnosed were primarily in people who were traveling from more the more affected countries, coming back to the United States and having those isolated incidents. So Dr. Dekaus, where are we now? Are we really just looking at people who are traveling from those countries or we are very much beyond that point? I think unfortunately we're pretty far beyond that right now. So initially those reports were people who had direct contact with someone who was known to have COVID or someone who had traveled to a country with COVID. However, uh, some recent studies looking, looking at a molecular clock, kind of the genetic change of the, of the virus over time, have actually estimated that the COVID virus has actually been in our population and circulating and unrecognized probably for several weeks before it really uh, beca uh, became uh, up to our awareness. And so would you agree, we're at the point where people will hear, hear the term community spread? Correct. And, and this is why we perhaps are seeing a more rapid uh, pace of those case numbers going up, that it's, it's now at the point where people are coming home, they're very easily spreading it to the people who they live with, they work with, they come in contact with in the community. That is very true. So this is, uh, this is something that unfortunately is in the community um, and it is being spread person to person. And uh, unfortunately it's fairly fa uh, infectious. So a, a value that we uh, um, uh, use is that this is, one person can infect on average uh, about two to 2.5 other people. Uh, that's the R naught value. It's used in, uh, in uh, mathematical calculations. Uh, and all of the social mitigation uh, processes that are happening right now are basically to drive that number down and reduce the transmission rate. Now, when we're talking about driving the numbers down, Dr. Vinette, a lot of people hear about flattening the curve. So could you explain to people who, uh, who might not be familiar with that term, what is the curve and uh, what are we trying to accomplish by doing that? So um, you can have a gigantic high peak very rapidly over weeks and have a, have a, have a curve that advances rapidly and then comes down quickly. You can have a the same amount of people affected, but spreading the curve out a long, over a longer period of time. What we call the area under the curve, if you turned it upside down, it has the same amount of water you put into it, whether it's a high peak over a short period or a flatter peak over a longer period. 
And that's a very important concept for everybody to know because then there's a line that goes across the flattened peak, which is how much hospital capacity we have, how much intensive care unit capacity we have, how much, how many healthcare workers, mostly nurses who are the, who do the most of the work and the doctors who diagnose and manage complications. When the, that curve I exceeds the capacity, that's when people are going to die because they can't get necessary medical attention. And that's why flattening the curve is so important. And we're doing that right now in, in terms of uh, so social distancing, uh, isolating. There are a lot of uh, schools and businesses that have been closing down. Should we be doing more uh, to try and flatten the curve? I just want to make a little comment on that. Social isolation is great, but getting out and taking a run or a walk away from people is a fantastic thing to do. Just stay away from people so they don't cough on you. But, but reducing the density of people so they don't cough on each other or the chances of touching something and spreading it to your face is down. That's what the social distancing. I, wouldn't, I don't like to use say, social isolation. I say social distancing. Notice we're far enough apart, so but I, I don't feel isolated from you. I feel very close. But the idea is to be distanced because there's there's real reason to do that. And so uh, that prompted a lot of state officials to take some uh, official action in the state recently. Um, right now, many schools are closed, um, and parents are home with their kids, and they have a lot of questions about what to expect uh, and when will schools reopen. Um, I did talk to Miguel Cardona, the uh, education commissioner here in Connecticut, about how long schools might be closed for. We are taking direction from our public health officials who are monitoring the transmission of the virus and making recommendations for the governor to consider on duration of closures, but also on the, the intensity. So by that I mean, you know, the, the size of, of groups that are assembled together. As you know, the governor has made recommendations, um, as have other governors throughout the country. So, but at this point, schools are not closed for the remainder of the year. I would love to get our students back, uh, but not at the expense of safety. So we're going to make sure that we're taking our direction from our uh, health officials. And a lot of parents are asking, you know, what if, what if my child has some uh, learning disabilities or they need more, uh, they have special needs and they need more education resources. Um, and we asked the commissioner earlier today, uh, what, what's in store for, for those kids and those families? Many students with special needs are at home and the materials that are being provided are accessible to, to many of them, but for some students, uh, they're, they don't have access to those materials or the materials are not appropriate for their learning style. We also have English learners who uh, don't speak English and, and in many cases, many of the websites or the resources uh, are not able to be translated. So by no means do we feel that uh, sending a student to a website is sufficient, but at this point we want to make sure that we're giving students access and we're working really hard to uh, provide guidance. I think by the end of the week we're going to be able to provide some guidance uh, from our agency's special education uh, director. We're working with the federal government to make sure that our guidance is in line with their recommendations as well. And of course, uh, another effort on the state level to uh, enforce this social distancing and to encourage it. Um, there has been a huge economic impact as a lot of things are shutting down. Um, David Lehman is the Connecticut Commissioner of the Department of Economic and Community Development. I spoke with him yesterday about how the coronavirus may impact Connecticut's economy. What's best for public health, I think, is also best for the economy. So it's important that we um, 
you know, we address the public health aspect of us, limit the spread of the virus, uh, and really flatten that curve. And the quicker we do that and the quicker we see cases peaking or, or going down, um, you know, the quicker we can start resuming normal economic and community life here in the state. So I think while it's, um, <clears throat> you know, it's certainly painful and a big adjustment in the near term, I think it's necessary, again, important, most importantly from a public health perspective, but also as it relates to the economy, you know, to, to, be, to enable restaurants, bars, people to congregate in the ways that we all uh, like doing what is our normal life, we, we, need to, we need to get the virus under control first, and then we're going to hopefully restart and be stronger on the flip side of this. And Lehman also spoke specifically about how uh, this is impacting small businesses uh, in a different and unique way. I would say for small businesses in particular, you know, DECD has set up a, a business uh, relief hotline to answer and address any questions folks are having. Um, and we understand there are, there are many. So that number is 860 uh, 500 you know, the, the, the goal there is to help answer questions. You know, the the state, state businesses are eligible for SBA disaster relief loans, which are loans up to $2 million for businesses and nonprofits with a term of up to uh, 30 years. So we're, we're answering those questions, and, and if there are other uh, questions that come up, we're, we're referring them on to the right different departments, whether that be labor for unemployment uh, insurance, for example, or if there's questions about when to file tax returns to the Department of Revenue Services. Uh, Layman also said that there are some people in the workforce who uh, can't do their work from home. Uh, and as we know, many of those people are healthcare workers. They are on the front lines of this coronavirus, including my guests here tonight, um, and many of the others who are uh, running the mobile clinics, who are in the hospitals, in the nursing homes. Um, so as we see the demand on the healthcare systems grow, uh, some of the biggest questions center on whether or not hospitals and nursing homes and other offices uh, have enough patients patient supplies like ventilators and hospital beds. And so, Dr. Diekhaus, when we look at what supplies we have and the workforce on how to address something so rapidly growing, um, do we have enough right now uh, and will we have enough going forward? So that is a very important question and I'm not sure that I have the answer to it. Uh, flattening the curve, uh, as Dr. Vinette said, is uh, critical uh, because we want to lower that, uh, the number of patients that we have to uh, evaluate kind of simultaneously. If we can spread that burden out over time, that's going to help. That being said, uh, our workforce is, is very important to us. We want to be able to maintain that workforce. Uh, and so one of the key factors uh, is to uh, protect them. And so to have adequate uh, personal protective gear, so the masks, the gloves, the gowns, that sort of thing is, is incredibly important to maintain. Uh, and as we've seen in Boston and New York and many other places, uh, the supplies of PPE have, have decreased dramatically. And so we have to really look at that very carefully as we're going into this to preserve that and use what we have as carefully as we can. Now, at the moment, we have adequate stocks. Uh, but we are reevaluating that regularly. Uh, in terms of patient supplies, uh, you've heard talks of, of you know, adequate numbers of ventilators, adequate numbers of ICU rooms. Um, and I know at my institution, I'm sure every institution in the state is reevaluating their workforce. Uh, they're also reevaluating their floor plans and where to place patients. Uh, I spent today walking around looking at oxygen bibs uh, to see uh, really how many people we can fit in various locations and to develop a plan for how we're going to restructure our hospital to manage this, this influx. So I think planning is really key. Um, Italy, uh, unfortunately, was caught uh, by surprise. Uh, we have the advantage of looking at what happened in Italy and being able to say, how can we do this better? Dr. Vinatz. And there are public health experts at the CDC who I find to be uh, the most credible source of information have, have suggested that um, we don't need negative pressure rooms in the hospital, generally speaking. So what's that? It's a room that sucks the air in so that the infection doesn't come out. And initially, people were put into negative pressure rooms because, because very appropriately, hospitals were worried. But the CDC has provided guidelines uh, based on evidence that the most important way, because negative pressure rooms are also limited, that putting our c confirmed COVID patients into individual rooms and having limited entry and exit from the rooms 
and sanitizing the rooms in the itself is going to be an adequate way. So just because somebody who has the COVID infection is not in a negative pressure room in a hospital, that doesn't mean they're not getting the best of care. That's official, very well informed guideline. And, and that's an important thing for our public to know. And Dr. Animadu, I know that a lot of the uh, hospitals within the Hartford healthcare system as well have been changing protocols and things that they're doing to try and keep both their patients and their doctors safe. Uh, have you as have you had to do anything differently, or is there anything um, that you specifically have been seen uh, being done that is that is uh, taking those things into consideration? That's right. So as Dr. Bennett said, initially when all this started, the CDC gave guidance that we should put patients in negative pressure room. So that's exactly what we did. And uh, quickly did we realize that the negative pressure rooms will definitely not be enough for all the patients that we are getting. And there's more data coming out that clearly says that as I initially alluded to, that the transmission of this virus is mainly by droplet, right? And I choose my words very carefully because there was recently an NEGM simulated study that said that the virus could be in an aerosol for about an hour. Right, or, and again, not just an hour, but it can hang on surfaces for between three to 72 hours, right? And so it got people very concerned that you, on one hand, you're telling us the virus can be in an aerosol for an hour, and on the other side, you're telling us we should put patients, we shouldn't put patients in a negative pressure room. But I would say that there's a lot of data supporting the fact that patients can be in a regular room with a droplet precaution where, uh, where healthcare professionals who are going in will put on gowns, put on gloves, put on mask and a face shield so that we can prevent transmission to health work healthcare workers. And that's exactly what we're doing now and people are very happy with what we're doing. And, and I would just want to provide a little context. So chicken pox pneumonia happens hugely infectious, so you can see the whole hallway get infected. Measles, when somebody with measles, before they get symptoms, can be expelling aerosols into the air for days, and people can get infected. One person with measles can infect 30 or 40 other people. Even tuberculosis has negative pressure rooms because it's such a concerning infection. COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, is, no, is none of those. It's, and so we don't need those negative pressure. So we have a lot of experience as physicians and as public health practitioners. And this is, there's good reason to trust these recommendations. And I wanna, I wanna turn now to testing, um, cause that's been a lot on a lot of everyone's minds. We've been hearing state officials talk about testing uh, nonstop and as well as the medical community uh, about how important it is to get as many people tested but there's also a problem with that right now. So Dr. Deekhaus, um, could you talk about, you know, what is this test? That Take the mystery right. a little bit about out of what is this test and how it actually is done. Sure, so this is a test, it's, um, uh, it's a swab. So it's a very thin swab that's uh, in the, it placed into the nasopharynx, um, so back in the nose. Uh, we can also do an oral swab, or if someone is coughing, you can do this on secretions. Uh, and it's a test called a PCR, uh, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, and this is something that originally was done at the state lab uh, at the Deep, uh, Department of Public Health in Rocky Hill. Uh, now, that was the first swing, and, the, and unfortunately we were behind the curve uh, because the first kits, if you will, uh, were faulty. Um, and so we lost time. And so we lost the ability to really measure this epidemic in the way that we needed to measure it. Um, and so we're a little bit behind on that. Uh, commercial labs have since come in, uh, so Quest and ARUP and a number of others have come in. Uh, and so uh, the testing capacity is increasing dramatically, uh, even this week. Uh, with that, uh, we've had uh, the ability to do more testing on, I guess, lesser uh, acuity levels. So initially this was restricted to only patients who were admitted to the hospital with a pneumonia that wasn't otherwise explained. We're able to broaden that now. Um, so people that have more classic symptoms of uh, COVID uh, are able to go to a testing center and, be, uh, and, and get a test. 
turnaround time is still an issue. Uh, turnaround times may be up to a couple of days. Um, and so we're asking if, you, if, it's, if you're in doubt uh, to self-isolate until you get those uh, results back. Uh, but at least we're starting to get some of this data to trickle in. And, and so this is something different than maybe a rapid flu test, test which people get immediate answers to in, in the doctor's office. They know they don't have it, or they do. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So this is, uh, this is something that does have a uh, one-day turnaround time, so you have to plan for that. You're not going to get an answer if you go through the drive through uh, You're not going to get to the end of the drive through window and get, a, uh, get an answer. Now, is it true, you know, across all, all of your healthcare systems, we are... Uh, they are doing more testing, certainly, of people. There are mobile centers now, drive-throughs, if you will, um, where people, a lot of people can stay in their cars, come through, and they get that nasal swab with very limited physical contact with anybody else. But um, we have heard from some listeners that are still having trouble getting approved for the testing. They may have one of the symptoms. Uh, they may have two. Maybe the message has not reached their general practitioner yet. So. What are your advice for people who may think that they genuinely have been exposed and they've been experiencing some of these symptoms, but they still are struggling to get that prescription for that test? So Hartford Healthcare did institute uh, the whole idea of the mobile testing, and we did, uh, we have a few of the uh, drive-through centers, right? But as Dr. DeKal said, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, we are still trying to catch up with testing, and it's become a very difficult thing. Initially, when the center at Hartford Hospital was open, in one day they tested about 30 people in a very short period of time. And quickly we are running out of the kits, right? But the goal was to open a center at Hartford Hospital, which is open, and then another center at Mid States, and another center at St. Vincent Hospital, another center at Bacchus. Hospital. So the whole idea was to make this very accessible to everyone. But unfortunately, because we are still uh, sort of um, lagging behind the testing, we don't have enough kits to keep this up. And, and so we've heard some of other countries around the world, specifically South Korea, uh, they got to a point where they did have enough tests. They started testing every, they tried to test as many people as possible, um, including people who may not have been showing a lot of symptoms, who may not have been showing any symptoms. Um, so would that be the ideal scenario here that we could test anybody if even they thought that they would have could have been exposed, and is there any benefit to testing people who may be asymptomatic? Dr. Yeah. Dekaus. So I, I think from an epidemiologic standpoint, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, so the data would suggest that there is some transmission that happens in the uh, pre-symptomatic period. Um, and so if you can identify those patients before they become symptomatic, and typically that's someone who's exposed to someone who has diagnosed disease, uh, you can then pull them out of uh, pull them out of society, so to speak, and put them in quarantine um, or treat them, um, and thus contain the the epidemic. You have uh, two two uh, uh, concepts uh, for uh, controlling the epidemic. One is containment, and that's identifying patients who are infected and able to give it to others, uh, and, uh, and instituting appropriate measures such as isolation. Um, and the other is mitigation, and that's d directed for the person who could potentially become infected. That's washing your hands, that's social distancing, uh, and uh, avoiding large crowds. So you're attacking it from both ends. If you can get data on who is potentially out in the community uh, as a transmitter, that's a very important step to make. And I, I might Mason. add, however, you know, all, I agree with all of that. But if you start testing, so testing is a public health need. It is not an individual clinical need right now. In a time where we don't have resources to test every single person in our society, who do you test and why do you test? Just because somebody says, I want to be tested, doesn't mean any action is going to be taken. We all have to assume right now we're all infected and have to socially distance. But who should be tested? It's people who are at risk for spreading and aren't following the right practices. It's people, right now, we, even the, the algorithms still say, have you been abroad? Have you n been in touch, with, in contact with somebody who you know has it? We're way beyond that. We're now in the mitigation stage. 
the infections can happen everywhere. But then the next question is, why does somebody need to go to the doctor? I, I, maybe I'm anticipating your question. And, and so if somebody has a, a, a flu-like illness, they feel lousy, they've got a headache, headache is prominent. Um, I call it prodromal, but then they maybe have a fever and a dry cough. If they're otherwise able to get around, take care of themselves, they need to stay at home. They don't really need to be tested because it's pretty likely that they have such an infection. And what are you going to do about it if they're negative? You have to retest them? How often do you retest them? So the, it turns out, and if I may make a slightly political comment, um, the media, some of the media, has gone extreme and say, well, we need more testing, testing, testing. And that's a political statement. That's not a public health statement. The public health statement is you need to test people who are at risk for transmitting. That's really the important need. And you need to test people who may have something else that needs to be treated with specific therapies. The big difference between um, COVID-19 and influenza, we have diagnostic tests that are easily available for influenza. We have drugs for influenza. We have vaccines for influenza. And we have none of that for a COVID-19 virus. So what can we do? We can do one thing, social distancing. That's right. So I, I agree with all that. And it's, it's very important. But I think the dynamics are going to change a little bit when we have treatment <laughs> for COVID-19, right? Then everyone would want to be tested if I have it, then treat me, right? But because we don't have treatment for it at this point, when the disease becomes very widespread, then it doesn't matter whether you have it or whether you don't. If we're in the season and it's a pandemic and everyone has, anyone who has these symptoms, you just social distance and isolate yourself, right? But if we do have treatment, then it will become even more necessary to test everyone who has symptoms so you can treat them. Do you think it's, it's people who do want to get tested and they do want to know because this is so new? Because we certainly see, I think it's fair to say that during flu season, uh, if you can mitigate your symptoms, maybe uh, you're not having, uh, you're having a very mild case. Uh, some people don't ever go get the flu test. They never confirm it is, they just assume it is. They stay at home, they self-treat and they go on. Um, but because this is so new, it, does that factor into why people want to rush and get tested? So l let me just take a crack at that. So we're here, uh, you have three doctors with you who are here to provide some rationality. The media, especially cable news, is not really known for providing rationality. It's, it's kind of driving up hysteria, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum. And so it's clear you test when you're going to take action. It's clear, I agree with you, that people are saying, oh my god, this is new. We know more about this infection in a matter of two or three months than we know about almost any infection in two or three months. It's really remarkable. And, and what we know is what we can do about it right now. It's very clear. And so uh, people need to be tested when a public health authority or a, or a clinical system says, we need to know where to intervene. And, and, but just because, oh, I want to know if I, I can go out and have a party, that is inappropriate. Just because you want to test as an individual doesn't mean it's appropriate to get a test. That's very un-American, I know. But that's what all doctors and all public health authorities, that's decoding what we're thinking. And like you said, social distancing, uh, if, if you were to assume that you may have al may already be infected, maybe you're not experiencing symptoms, uh, but you do social distance, you stay away maybe from people who are among the most vulnerable groups, um, and that turns out to, even if you're wrong, even if you may not be infected, uh, that is limiting the chance of somebody else getting infected. Um, there's a lot of research being done right now, and we talked a little bit about you know, some of the things that we don't know about this virus yet, um, even though it's a, among a family of other uh, viruses that we do know about. Um, we don't know everything about this one just yet. Um, and something that you had mentioned before, Dr. Vernetz, 
do you th is there research being done on a way to see if people um, can test people for the antibodies to see if they had ever had COVID-19? Um, and as you just mentioned a couple minutes ago, there will likely be people who are infected with COVID-19. They may know that or they may think it's the flu. They self-treat at home and they never have confirmed that they actually had it. So is research being done on a way to actually see if we've developed antibodies? So that's, a, that's an important question. It's an important question for public health, it's for policy, it's for epidemiology, it's for finding out really what's the circulatory, circulation patterns, what we call transmission dynamics. It's complicated because there are other coronaviruses and we don't know if the test that we make for COVID-19 is gonna cross-react or not cross-react. These are the, what's called validation. Um, I want to call out Ellen Foxman, who's a professor in lab medicine at Yale, who is a real expert. And she is all over this. Aaron Ring is a basic scientist. He's making these proteins in his lab. We should have some of them to start looking at people next week with the laboratory medicine, with the real professionals that know how to um, figure out, is this a good test or not? And that will be very useful. And, and among the research that's going on now, have uh, are there any other anything looking into clinical research um, or other scientific studies that uh, you all think uh, needs to be is really the focus right now uh, that you would really like to see uh, in the next couple months, in the next couple years? We know these things take time. So that's right. There, uh, there are vaccines that we need. There are treatments that we need as well. Right and. Uh, a couple of days ago, that was on uh, March 16th, the first human vaccine was, a trial was started and the first person got the, the vaccine. But as you know, it takes about 18 months, 12 months to 18 months before we can have a full vaccine ready for public use, right? Because in that study that NIH is doing with Moderna, they are enrolling about uh, 45 people who would get one vaccine 28 days apart, so two vaccines in all, and then they would have to monitor these patients for about a year, right? So vaccine is definitely needed. It's an urgent public health need at this point, but unfortunately we can't get it until about uh, 12 to 18 months away, right? But yes, there are treatments that NIH is looking into, the, the remdesivir, that it's being considered as well, and it's, it's actually being given to patients under compassionate use, and then the NIH is studying it as well. And there are a few other investigational medications too that are being considered. I might amplify a little bit on that. Um, when we talk about vaccines, we, the first thing is safety. And some vaccines in the past have actually in clinical trials led to worse outcomes for some people. And so safety first, you can't give a vaccine that's going to make an outcome of the real infection worse. And so there's no guarantees that either a full length protein, the S protein, or a piece of it, the part that sticks to the cells, if that's even gonna work. Those are the lead candidates. There's different platforms that different companies are using. Now, I need to go into the technical details. But, but what do we do about therapeutics? So Gilead, fantastic antiviral um, pharmaceutical company, um, tested remdesivir for Ebola a few years ago. And so it's already passed phase one and phase two clinical trials. It's an intravenous drug, has to be given IV. Can't give that out to populations, can only give that to sick people. And it's gonna be most effective probably early on, if it's effective at all. I have heard through the grapevine that um, the early data, which there should be a lot of, has been delayed in its release, a little bit concerning. That being said, there are two compounds used um, in Japan, approved for clinical use in Japan, one for pancreatitis, one for uh, seasonal influenza. Those seem to have some in vitro experimental laboratory effectiveness. We should be tearing down the walls to the FDA. It's approved, it's not in clinical trials. We should accelerate those medications into our clinical trials 
done the U.S. way rigorously and effectively because right now we're in the upswing of an epidemic. And finally, um, I, the, the idea about clinical research being performed on patients who are suffering is very important because what can we do about this infection? One of the things that happened after Ebola was using people that had recovered from Ebola using their plasma, can, which has antibodies, to treat people with Ebola. And some people did well. And a company named Regeneron made so-called monoclonal antibodies, a biologic, fiendishly expensive, especially in the developing world, but seemed to have a positive effect. So these are the models that we can take from Ebola. And so we need our patients with COVID-19 infection to say, I want to get better myself, because that's number one. And number one A, if you will, is I want to donate my blood or my sputum or my swabs to science so we can come up with better therapeutics. And that's um, uh, a public service appeal that people aren't being experimented on just to write papers by um, egghead academics. It's because we need to deploy new treatments and as quickly as possible without causing harm. That is the clinical research of highest priority right now. So when we talk about a lot of the things that scientists and medical researchers are still looking at and still looking for the answers, especially in regards to treatment and vaccines, uh, right now we don't have those. So to really drive home the po point, Dr. Dekaus, uh, for people right now in this moment who may be experiencing symptoms who, who will be in the next coming days, weeks, and months. We talked a little earlier in the show tonight um, about what exactly those symptoms would be. So we have a we have a whole panel of doctors here. Um, when people sh when should people be going contacting their doctor if they just have a cough, if they just have a fever, if they have just breathing issues, a combination? Uh, people are asking, when do I actually pick up the phone? Right, and that's a very good question, and, and I like the way you you put that. When do I pick up the phone? Um, one thing that we do not want is someone to just simply arrive. Um, certain, certainly if you're in extremis, you know, that some, we want to see you. Um, but the best thing to do is, if you're in doubt, is to pick up the phone and contact someone. There's a 211 number. I know that UConn Health has a, has a call number, Hartford Hospital likewise. Um, and discuss it with someone to try to figure out what you need to do. So discuss your symptoms. Typically it's fever plus uh, cough uh, or shortness of breath. Um, and discuss that. Uh, there may be options available to you in terms of doing a drive-through. Uh, there may be options in terms of, if you're short of breath, needing to come in and actually being physically evaluated. Or it may be something that's actually quite benign. If I can disclose a personal history, my son actually called me yesterday and said, Dad, I've got a low-grade fever and a cough. What do I do? And we actually set up an e-visit with his physician. And so he had a, a, had a, a visit with his physician uh, over trans-telephonic means um, and was determined that he did not need testing. And so that was a good outcome, as, as I see it. So I think that sort of thing is uh, something that we need to replicate in Connecticut. And so very quickly, we only have a couple minutes left, but I did want to ask your final thoughts. Any other things that you, that people should know about this, people should keep in mind. This is uh, something new. It can be scary, um, but we know from what's happening in other parts of the country that people are surviving this. Uh, they are getting through it and they are going on. So one of the things that I would say is that we want to make sure that people don't panic. But again, we want to let them know that this is nothing to be taken lightly, right? We know that about 80% of people who get COVID-19 will do very well. But unfortunately, there is a small percentage that will not do well, especially patients who have uh, comorbid conditions and patients who are immunocompromised may not do well. So if there's, uh, what I keep telling my patients is that there's never been a time in history where washing your own hands, covering your own cough, uh, covering your sneeze has been this altruistic, right? It's, uh, it's an act of altruism, and we all have to have our hands on deck to help curb the trajectory of this pandemic. Dr. Dekaus. 
So I, I agree 100%. And I'd like to focus on, on the hospital aspect of things. Um, so there's certainly a lot of concern about capacity of hospitals, but hospitals are working very hard right now uh, to be able to increase the capacity to be able to manage this expected inflow. One of the best things that you can do from an altruistic standpoint is, like Dr. Anyamato said, don't get sick. Um, mitigate uh, the chance of you coming down with, with, an, with this disease, especially coming down with dis this disease in the peak when everybody else is going to have it. So if we can stretch that out, it's going to make it much easier for the healthcare system to absorb uh, this uh, impending crisis uh, and make it much less uh, damaging. And Dr. Vanetz. Thank you again. Thanks to my colleagues and to you for having me on. Um, so it is not time to panic because there's a new virus causing a pandemic. So let's just get those words and not worry about those words. But we need to act as a community, not as individuals. And this is culturally against everything America stands for. Right now we have to get over that. It, the, the rounds of transmission take a couple of weeks. So if you could imagine that there's overlapping rounds of transmission, that's the basis for the warnings that this is gonna be lasting a couple of months. And we need to take that seriously. We need to have our younger people take that seriously, especially during spring break in Florida, um, as an example. Um, that's, um, be a community member, don't be an individual and flout those norms. Uh, well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you all uh, for coming in. We are uh, Dr. Henry Anyamadu, the infectious diseases doctor at the Hospital of Central Connecticut, Dr. Kevin Deekhouse, chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at UConn, and Dr. Joseph Vinets, press professor of infectious diseases at Yale School of Medicine. We want to wish everyone a safe and healthy good night. Thank you for joining us. Thanks.